All right, moving on, we're going to start on Freemasonry, and the article I have is called Freemasonry, a Luciferian Beacon. You can type in the word Mason, M-A-S-O-N, into the search bar, creationliberty.com, and that'll take you to the article, or if you're listening by YouTube, you can click the link in the description, and that should take you roughly to where we are. So before we start, I did want to make mention of this, that we, we just ended our fourth year of audio teachings, and we're starting year five and I make mention of that because we, we do have thumb drives that we offer for, for each year of teachings. We'll provide the entire year of teaching. And then we also put in all the PDFs because Tim in our church, he, does, he, he can do, does conversions of the articles into PDFs for people to download if they want to. And so we pack all those into a thumb drive and we sell them for, it's like $20 a piece, which is I, I think is not a bad, not bad for considering that you know the years of effort and study and research that's been put into all these and the time and effort to put in because each of them has like 80 to 90 hours of audio teaching and all the PDFs related that goes along with them but and on top of that though in contrast I don't want to make people think that we make a bunch of money off of these things I mean it, they are to to help support Lorraine and I but at the same time, you can also buy your own thumb drive and you can download all of them and put them on there if you want to for yourself. And the reason I point that out is because I still, like we, the first one I did, says we just finished year four. When we finished year one, which would have been three years ago, I purchased a set of 25 of those thumb drives. Now we gave away a number of them. Uh, but I purchased a set of those thumb drives. It was 25 of them, and I still have not sold through them. So I don't want people to sit back and think that, you know, just because we have a store, we sell a bunch of stuff. We do not, okay? And so those are just there for people if they want to get them to help support Lorraine and I, and if they don't, that's fine. We, we offer a lot of stuff for free. And again, there's not that many people that listen to us anyway, so who's going to want that, right? That's... Uh, the point. So I try not to get too much into that, but I have been trying to each year go ahead and add on the new one. And I just, any anything that, whatever small amount of profits we make from those, basically I've only made enough each year to invest into the new year set, right? So I'll, I'll do like a, I'll do year three, I guess this year or something like that, and then invest into a new set. And so um, it's not that we're really making any money from that because I keep reinvesting it. So um, whatever we've got. And so even even that first set, it was one of the members of our church. And he knows who he is who donated the money for us to get that in the first place because I didn't have the money to invest into it back then. So I appreciate that he did that. And um, I'm sorry that we haven't seen any more fruit from it, but that's not something I can really control, right? So... Anyhow, uh, we're going to keep doing that in a, on a year-by-year -year basis, and I think what I'm doing is, is starting to develop playlists like on YouTube and things like that to where the playlists will do it by each year uh, because I found there's some stuff that started to bug out a little bit on, on the playlists and all that, and so I'm trying to fix those problems. Anyway, I just want to make mention of that for people, that uh, this is the beginning of, of year five on this, and so we're going to start out talking about Freemasonry and what it's all about. Now, I, the original reason I wrote this article was in... I had a request from one of the members of our church here who had requested this for her friend. It was a friend that she's grown up with from childhood, that she's known for decades, and they've been best friends for the longest time. But this friend of hers claims to be a Christian, but has been involved with the Freemasons for most most of her life, really. And I started work on this, uh, I, if I remember right, it was like two years before I published it. Because I published it in, what was it, in January 2017, and I started on it maybe a year and a half, two years, something like that before I actually published it. It's just I, I was working on different things and I got sidetracked and all that. But it was at that request that I did this. And what turned out to be is that when I 
made this, she wouldn't even look at it. Not one word would she read of any of that. Not another member of our church, I'm talking about her friend, would not read any of it. And so that's why I didn't direct it at her or just, you know, write in it like I'm talking to one person. I just wrote this generally for the Christian church. Now, those of you who may have studied Freemasons and think that you're not going to learn anything from this, well, keep reading or keep listening if you're listening or if you just want to read it. You should pay attention to some of these. There might be a few things that you could learn from it. I realize there's some people that think they know everything there is to know about Freemasonry. Well, keep listening. and Because what I'm going to be doing is not only exposing Freemasonry, and the way I'm doing it is... Because, folks, I, I was really disappointed in a lot of what I saw online when people were documenting Freemasonry. Because I say documenting in a very loose term, because they weren't documenting much at all. They were saying, basically, you go on to, like, an internet search engine and find a website that talks about Freemasons, and then you get an article in which they say, here's what Freemasons believe, here's what they teach, and it's all these generalized writings, but where did they get this information from? Most of the time, they don't say. I'm not saying that's like that in every instance, but most of the time, they don't tell you where they got the information from. And some of the quotations, you know, I saw pieces of a quotation, but I was like, where's the whole quote? And so I've hunted down entire quotations. I've hunted down all the sources of everything that I'm, I'm talking about here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quoting to you directly from Freemason authorities, those who are considered the highest authorities, the most well-respected among all Freemasons. I'm going to be quoting you f them. And I'm going to also be exposing in some part the false teachings about Freemasonry. Like there's some there's a lot of these people that teach on Freemasons and try to expose them, but they have accused there's some people that are being falsely accused of being Freemasons when they're not. And what I mean by that is that there are people who can work with Freemasons and not be a Freemason. And that's something that people, at least I would say Christians, need to stop doing. If you're claiming to be of Christ, don't falsely accuse someone Make sure you've got evidence before you jump out and make a claim. Like, just because they'll have somebody who's in the popular mainstream media, they'll say, oh, they're a 33rd degree Mason. Not only are they not 33rd degree, there's no evidence that they even joined the Freemasons ever. And so that's that's something that we're, we're, we're going to cover some of that stuff later, because those are things that that really irritates me when people claim to be Christians and they'll just jump out and make accusations without evidence. Okay? And you don't, just because somebody is evil and wicked and doing something evil and wicked does not automatically make them a Freemason. Some of them are. But there's others who are not. In fact, I would say many who are not. Or they may be a part of a different secret society. Because there's more than one secret society outside of Freemasons, okay? There's more than one secret society outside of the Illuminati. And we're going to discuss the Illuminati in this series of teachings as well. So, my point is just Stay tuned to all that. Try to get through these teachings. Even if you've studied Freemasonry before, I'm going to go through the general understanding of it. Okay. So Freemasonry is not very well understood by the general public. I mean, that should be obvious because the general public seems to have this, like, okay, Freemasonry, like, it's like this aloof thing and everybody's just kind of lackadaisical about it, right? They, they drive by a Freemasonic temple and most of the time, they won't even know they're there. And if they do read a sign that says that's a Freemason temple, they're like, oh, and they keep moving. Like, they don't even acknowledge it. So it's almost like it doesn't even register in their head of what it is. And the general consensus, even if you asked the public, you know, what are, what are the Masons? And they think they're a bunch of, a group of old men who get together, maybe some, smoke cigars and pat each other on the back for their many accomplishments while, you know, they occasionally do something charitable for the city. If you even get that extensive of an answer, it'll be something vague like that. Most of the time, you won't even get an answer like that. Most of the time, they'll be like, I don't know, some club. And that's about all you're going to get because people don't know what the Freemasons are. They don't know what they teach. They don't know what they do. And they just ignore it. Well, there's a reason I titled this teaching Freemasonry a Luciferian Beacon. Because it is a beacon for Luciferians. 
It is a satanic religion, and yes, it is a religion, as I'm going to demonstrate. Okay, these are not things I'm, I'm not just going to fly by this stuff. I'm going to prove these things as we go through this. Okay? And so people are driving by a satanic cult, and they don't even realize they're doing it. I mean, there's very few people who have who know enough details about the Masons to discern who they are, what they do, or anything like that. And it's partially, I would say, that's understandable. Because their temples and the branches within their temples, many of them, they're very ambiguous. And they're more secretive, even though they're claiming in more modern days that they're not secretive. And I'll give you an example. The United Grand Lodge of England is a Masonic Lodge that's been in operation for hundreds of years. And they give their general definition of Freemasonry. On their website, on their about page, they say, quote, Freemasonry is one of the world's oldest and largest non-religious, non-political, fraternal, and charitable organizations. It teaches self-knowledge through participation in a progression of ceremonies. Members are expected to be of high moral standing and are encouraged to speak openly about Freemasonry. End quote. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm, la- I'm trying not to laugh while I'm reading this because almost everything they said in that short statement is a complete lie. The opposite is actually the truth. I mean, they say we are non political, but Freemasonry is incredibly political. They say that they are non-religious, and yet Freemasonry is purely religious. Purely religious, incredibly political. They claim the members were of high moral standing, but that only extends about as far as the public can see. They're basically whited sepulchers. They make the outside look good, but inside they're full of dead men's bones. That's why Jesus Christ called the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees whited sepulchers. They always make the outside look good, but the inside is full of dead men's bones. And so that's exactly what the Freemasons do. And they will, as we're going to find out later, they swear oaths to never openly speak about the true hidden meanings behind Freemasonry. So when they say they're encouraged to speak openly about it, that's only within a certain degree that they're allowed to speak openly about it because they're not allowed to speak on pain of death, swearing oaths that they are not allowed to speak about the secret meanings and hidden things they do. So, when I talk about them cleaning out the outside, I'll give you an example. The Shrine Circus is a very famous example. The Shriners, it's a well-known branch of Freemasonry, and many children across America have attended one of their shrine circus events that they have. And I, including myself, I've been to them, I think when I was 10, we went on a school trip and I went to a shrine circus where they had all the shriners there and they have their hats, which they call fezes, which are also demonic, by the way, and I will demonstrate that in a later part of this teaching. It won't be right now, but we're going to get to that later. But... They basically leaves an impression with American public. It's they're a charity club, right? We're a charity of old men that get together and and we do charitable things. That's what they see. And on the Shriners International website, it says, quote, Shriners are a brotherhood of men committed to family, engaged in ongoing personal growth, and dedicated to providing care for children and families in need, end quote. Well, doesn't that sound wonderful? Doesn't that sound pleasant and kind and generous? Really? I mean, how could they possibly be bad? Again, if we only looked at the outside of masonry and took it at face value, it's going to look like a good organization. But I want to take us inside. Now, the general public is completely oblivious to the fact that in order to become a Shriner, you must first get to a high level in the Masonic religious order. And that takes a lot of money and dedication. I mean, these different degrees they get, which we're going to talk about those later, but the different degrees that they get, you have to pay for them. And it's not cheap. Okay? It takes a lot of dedication and money to achieve that high level of rank. And what a lot of people don't know is that they have to swear oaths 
unto pagan gods to get that far. Now, if the world had a better understanding of who the god of Freemasonry really is, I think a lot of people would distance themselves from the organization and be a lot... They would probably be more fearful of it and what it is and try to get it out of their communities. But many of them are blissfully ignorant, willingly blissfully ignorant, about what they actually do, including many of their low rank members. There's people that get involved in what they call the Blue Lodge. That's just the first three degrees, where you don't have to be too involved with it. Most people are at that level within Freemasonry, and many of them don't even fully understand what's going on. But to get a better understanding, generally, of what I mean when I say this is satanic, I'm going to look at the writings of Manly Palmer Hall. That's Manly P. Hall. If you've ever heard of him before, some of you probably have had heard that name, if you don't know who he is. He lived from 1901 to 1990, and he's considered by Freemasons to be the most influential Mason of the 20th century. Okay, so he is highly respected as an authority in Freemasons. Manley Hall was the founder of the Philosophical Research Society, and he was a 33rd degree Mason. Now, 33rd degree is what they call the General, or excuse me, the Grand Sovereign Inspector General. And so he was the 33rd degree Head Mason over the Jewel Lodge Number 374 in San Francisco, which is known today as United Lodge. Now, he wrote a book, a famous book among Freemasons, which they still hold as a high up authority, called The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. Here's what he said on page 48, quote, When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy, end quote. Now, you got to understand, a lot of Freemasons don't even know that he said this. A lot of them don't. However, there's a number of them that probably don't care either. Okay? <laughs> they would just write it off or just think that, well, it probably it was taken out of context somewhere. This is not taken out of context. And as we go through more quotations from the authorities of Freemasonry, I'll show you what I mean. This is not at all taken out of context. He is saying that there is a certain amount of witchcraft that a mason has to learn to understand the full mysteries of Freemasonry in general. And that once they have what they call control or understanding or power over performing that witchcraft, then the seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. And then he must prove his ability to apply this energy and use Lucifer's power. That is the full understanding of the Freemason cult. And I want people to understand the difference between a Satanist and a Luciferian. And why I call this a Luciferian beacon rather than a Satanic beacon. And despite what a lot of churchgoers, you know, they sit in their ignorance and think it's all the same thing. Well, they're, they're serving the same God, in quotations, Satan. That's true. But... A Satanist, what he typically does is he focuses on the fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And he denies that there's any greater deity that mankind needs to aspire to, okay? And so he basically has the same kind of Satanistic... Like, for example, Aleister Crowley was a Satanist. And their common phrase they take from him, which is, do what thou wilt, right? Do what thou wilt is the phrase that they typically say, and that is a phrase that is saying, whatever feels good, do it. Okay, F Go ahead and fulfill the lust of your flesh. It's a message from the devil. And that's what a Satanist typically does. That's what they focus on, is their selfish fulfillment of the lust of the flesh. Okay? Now, a Luciferian is a little different. Now, they also do concentrate on fulfilling the lust of the flesh. I'm not saying that they're different in that. But they also have a different belief that they ought to aspire to do some in quotations, good evangelistic works for the purpose of spreading the Luciferian religion. Okay? 
That means they should do some things that are viewed in the public eye as a good or charitable act for the purpose of spreading the Luciferian religion. That's the difference between them, okay? So you're going to find that some people who our society would call humanitarians are actually Luciferians behind the scenes. I'm not saying all humanitarians are Luciferians, but there are some that are. And they don't say that to the general public because our society looks down or looks evilly upon Luciferians and Satanists. And so that's why a lot of it's typically hidden, and they don't let the public know that they do that stuff. But these are things that you have to look at. You have to look at evidence to see what's going on behind the scenes. So Masonry, then, is a perfect fit for Luciferians. Because it's an organization that allows Luciferians to grow and prosper within their cult, because they get special privileges and things like that. We're going to talk about that later. But they can also practice their witchcraft at the same time and do certain humanitarian projects while they're moving up Satan's organizational ladder. So... The quotation I gave from Manly B. Hall, again, that might be surprising to some people who don't understand much about the core beliefs of Masons, but these are the facts, okay? I'm not going to present to you a bunch of speculation. I'm going to present to you the facts. If I do speculate anything, I'm going to, at least I will do my best to try to tell you that I am speculating something, or here is my opinion about it. But for the most part, I'm going to be giving you the facts. And if you don't want to hear the facts, I would say go ahead and shut off this teaching. Don't waste your time listening to it. Go do something more productive, okay? Go plant some fruit trees or do something productive, but don't waste your time here. But if you want the truth, stay and keep listening, okay? But there's many people out there who are claiming to be Christians who are trying to defend masonry, Freemasonry, right? They're trying, which, it's, it's the same thing. If you ever heard them say Mason or Freemason, Mason's just a short way of saying it. It's all the same thing. But they're going to try to defend it because either they themselves have joined the Freemasons or someone they close to them, friend, family, or neighbor, is a Freemason. And so they will defend it. Very, I mean, I have never personally run into anyone who was not close to or involved in the Freemasons who were trying to defend it or, like, accusing me of being wrong. Most of the time they're like, wow, I didn't know that. When they have no personal connection to it. And that's what, that's what happens all the time is that people get built up and wrapped up in their emotions because of personal connections with things. I am saying, look, Christians, what we need to learn to do is put aside our emotions and look at the facts, okay? We might have a lot of emotions about a lot of different things, but Scripture is the facts. And so we need to look at Scripture and, and accept the facts for what they say, okay? Now, I hold masonry along the same lines as Mormons, okay? And I did a whole teaching on Mormonism, which you can see, if take a look at for yourself if you want to go to creationliberty.com. In the search bar, type in the word Mormon, M-O-R-M-O-N. And that'll give you an article called Corruptions of Christianity, Mormonism. And you can read through that. But they are very similar to Mormons in this respect. I'm not saying that there's no born-again Christians among the Mormons. But I'm, not, but I'm saying that a, a, someone who is born again of Christ will not stay in the Mormons very long. Okay. And I believe there's a lot of people that are coming out of, of cults like Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or things like that. And what they're doing is they're saying, oh, I got saved out of, out of that cult. But there's never any repentance of sin. There's never any grief and godly sorrow of wrongdoing of sin. Basically, it's that, well, I was in the wrong church building. That's kind of, I, I've heard so many testimonies of people doing that. And I think that's ridiculous. That... The, I think it's ridiculous the churches are not teaching them properly, but again, many of them are filled with false converts. So basically, they're going out of the frying pan and into the fire. In a lot of these instances, and I prayed for a number of these people that would just, that they, their souls would be saved, and that they would actually come to know the actual gospel. Not to just say, well, I received Jesus and everything's good now. I mean, they don't, they don't understand the fullness of the gospel. And again, I, I request that people would go to creationliberty.com, type in the word repent, R-E-P-E-N-T, into the search bar, and get an article called Repentance, or Is Repentance Part of Salvation? Repent has been defined to mean to turn. And so they define it as a works 
doctrine, when repentance means grief and godly sorrow of wrongdoing. And it's used to mean grief and sorrow in most places throughout Scripture. There are some places where it means to turn, but most places it means grief or sorrow. And so people need to get an understanding of what that means and why that the definition of that word has been so corrupted to modern day church buildings. We explain more in there. So anyway, I'm not saying there's there's no born again Christians among Masons, but a born again Christian is not going to be in the Masons very long. Because when you have the Holy Spirit on you, you're going to get conviction that's going to bother you in some way. And Christians are going to get out of there. Now, some, a lot of times what's happening is that they're involved in the Masons and they might become born again after they join the Masons and then they get out of it pretty quick because they start to see the offenses against Scripture. And so what I'm saying is that if there's someone in the Masons that you know, maybe, maybe he's a low-level Mason, might, might not know much about it, okay? Because some of these Mason meetings, I mean, the, the, the lady in our church I was talking about who had the friend who's involved in this, they're involved in a chapter of the Masons that, I mean, is for women because women are not allowed to go that high up in the Masons. But they're involved in the chapter and they, I mean, when they go into their weekly meetings, they sing Christian hymns in there. They do. But that doesn't mean anything. So do Catholics, so do Mormons, so do Jehovah's Witnesses, but they believe in false doctrine. Okay, so you might go into a temple, at least here in America, a Mason temple, and they'll have on a coffee table, they'll have the Bible sitting out. Or maybe they'll have it sitting on a stand, like somewhere elevated on a mantle, like they're honoring it. The, the problem with even Masons, who are, most of them are probably ignorant about this fact, is that if you go to India, to a Masonic temple in India, and they have them all over the world, if you go there they will have the, what do you call it, the Bhagavad Gita, I think is how you pronounce that or whatever it is, their, their, their so-called holy book, right? And they will on, do things and rituals that honor Hinduism and their gods over there. They don't have the same Christian-laced, I want to say Christian in quotations, the Christian-laced temples that they have over here in America because they simply alter themselves based on whatever religion is popular in that area because they don't believe in any of it they are a religion of themselves okay they're just trying to bait people to get in and they are part of trying to bring people under an ecumenical movement and so we'll we'll get into more details about that later in later parts of this teaching but my point being is that if you're talking with someone who's in the Masons in low level, they might be a new Christian somewhere along those lines, don't jump out and start saying, well, you're of the devil and things like that, because they're probably not going to listen to you. I mean, <laughs> you know, we can talk with them. But if you've got someone who's a high-level Mason, has been it for a long time and claims to be of Christ, you're likely dealing with a false convert, okay? Someone who's not actually of Christ, because how could you possibly be in something that satanic? and take all these O's to false gods without any kind of repentance for wrongdoing at all, without any kind of conviction. I don't understand how that's even possible. And so people would have to repent and, and come out and be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10.21 says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot per be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. I mean... There's some people out there who's either they're involved with Freemasonry or they know people who are, and they typically they don't want to believe that it's a Luciferian cult. But I we just read from Manly Hall, that's exactly what the end goal of it is: is to turn you into Luciferians that practice witchcraft. I'm not saying that someone joins the Freemason is going to be immediately put into all that. They have to be conditioned. Some of them never get high enough to even know. I mean, in their lives, never get high enough to know what it's actually about. And so what they do is they get emotionally wrapped up in it and say, no, this is a really good organization. Okay, for those of you who do that, let me, let me explain this to you. A few years ago, we actually learned from some of the documentation my sister found that my own grandfather, who 
worked and earned the very property we're living on right now was a 33rd degree mason. We didn't even know. Now, I had previously thought he was a born-again Christian, but after I learned about that, I can't see how that could po be possible. I don't see how it's possible at all that you could be a 33rd degree Mason, that, that Lucifer, Satan himself, would raise you to the high ranks of his organization and you being born again in Christ at the same time. I don't see how that's possible, because you have to take oaths unto him and by doing so have to denounce Christ. When I understood and I learned about all the rituals they practiced and what it takes to get to that level, I have a hard time believing my own grandfather was a Christian at all. I, I personally don't. I'm not saying it's not possible because maybe there's some weird thing that I don't understand, but based on the evidence that I have, I don't see how it's possible. I mean, many of the things they do, they have to surround themselves with stuff that's completely anti-biblical. And as we go through this, you'll see what I mean. So we've got to put away our presuppositions, way, the way we want to view things in our own eyes. I may want to view my grandfather as a Christian, but that doesn't mean he was. And so it's not the way we want to view it through our own eyes. We need to view things the way God sees them. Because Proverbs 21.2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. And Luke 16, 15 says, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. You see, when they have a way, they see, okay, whatever I just did, well, it was right because of this and this and this. You see, they try to give excuses. Well, no, I didn't do anything wrong because A, B, C, D. You see, they're giving excuses. That's what a justification is. Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. You're giving excuses to people, but God knows your hearts. And, of course, you have the churchianity churchgoers that say, well, God knows my heart and he knows I love Jesus. Yeah, but Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I'm not saying that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he saves us, does not come in and clean out our hearts and that the Holy Spirit can live in our hearts. But we have to understand that the heart of the flesh is deceitful and above all things and desperately wicked. And that's something that's almost, is, well, I would say almost because I don't know everybody else's situation. But the heart being deceitful and desperately wicked, of all the church buildings I grew up in, I never once remember hearing that ever being taught. And so they generally don't teach that. They teach that, oh, well, all you have to do is accept Jesus, and then your heart's perfect, so everything you feel is good, and it's of God. That's a false message. That is, you know, when they say that you're, when they try to equate their feelings to the Holy Spirit, that's a false message, okay? Your feelings can be in line with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can influence you and give you feelings, just like that's conviction to things, right? But that doesn't mean that everything you feel is of the Holy Spirit, and so you need to make sure you have the discernment to understand the difference between the two, okay? Because if you feel a way that is opposite to what God's Word says then that is not the Holy Spirit. So despite how good people might think the Freemasons are, in the eyes of the Lord God, there is nothing good about them. And Matthew chapter 7, verse 17 says, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. You are not getting good fruit out of the Freemasons. It's a satanic organization you're not going to get good fruit of it. And they said, yeah, but they do a charitable thing for this, like, children's hospital over here. You know what they just did by doing that charitable act, or so-called charitable act? First of all, the only purpose they do of it is to make the Masons look good, number one. There might be individuals in the Masons that are trying to help children, but their ultimate goal was to make the Masons look good, number one. And number two, that's the problem, is they try to make themselves look good. They are trying to get the public to think that a satanic organization is good in some way, to make themselves more popular. So we're going to see a lot more of examples of these roots of, of Satanism and, or Luciferianism in, in Freemasonry, but... I just want Christians to acknowledge that either the Lord Jesus Christ was right when he says there's no good that can come from it, or he was wrong. You either believe him or you don't. There's no debating, trying to make excuses, 
for Freemasonry. If you're in the Masons, you've got to choose who you're going to serve. As Joshua said in chapter 24 of Joshua 24, verse 15, it says, If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods of your, which were your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So make your choice. Okay? If you claim to be a Christian, then your job is to expose evil and darkness, not be a part of it, not be a member of it. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Don't have fellowship with them. Don't go to their meetings and join up with them. You reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Sadly, as we're going to see later, the Freemasonry authorities call their teachings light. And so they try to falsely use scripture as a, as a justification for people to believe in their demonic witchcraft. And I'll show you more of that as we go through. So let's put aside our personal feelings and let's begin by looking at the foundation of Freemasonry. Now in a debate against the Freemason Luther Mize, or Luther Mays, I don't know which way you pronounce it, it doesn't really matter. Walter was asking Mize the following question in this debate. He said, quote, Who are the authorities... In masonry, who could we refer to as authoritative? Mize responds, "I think most Masonic lodges would regard Mackey or Pike as valid authorities." End quote. Now, the reason I wanted you guys to hear that is because I want you to see an a Freemason who has authority in the Freemasons say, "Who are the authorities that you guys refer to on the facts of what Freemasonry is?" Here is him saying, in a public debate, it is Mackey or Pike are the ones that he would most go to, or that most lodges would acknowledge as the authority. So, this is referring to Albert Pike and Albert Mackey. That's their names, okay? And I'm going to be quoting from them many times throughout this teaching, so you want to keep their names in mind. I'm going to explain to you a little bit about who they are. But again, Luther Mize was a high-level Mason at the time of the debate, so I'm showing confirmation in case there's Freemasons that want to argue against what I'm saying. That's not what Freemasonry is about. I'm telling you the authorities over the so-called do-gooders club that you're in are saying otherwise. I'm going to show you from their own words what this is about. If by some slim chance a Mason would even listen to this. Because most of the time, you're not going to have anybody in the Freemasons even listen. I would be surprised, really, if if one was willing to do that. It would surprise me, although the Lord God can do what he wants with any of these teachings that we're doing. It's up to him whether or not somebody listens to them. And so, despite what you might personally want to believe about Freemasonry, Mackey and Pike have written down in clear English the core foundational beliefs for Freemasonry. I'm going to give you what those are. Now, first of all, let's start with Albert Pike, because he was a commander in the Confederate Army of the American Civil War. So that was for the southern states. He was the commander for the southern states. And he was a very well-known and highly respected 33rd degree Mason. Now, he was the leader of the Scottish Rite's southern jurisdiction. Now, there's a Scottish Rite and a York Rite. I'll go over what those are later. Don't worry about it right now. But there's a difference between the two, and I'll go over that in, in another part but he was and well by the way still is held in high esteem by Freemasons to this day he still is so much so that he had a statue erected of him in Washington D.C. he is the only now, now think about that for a moment Washington D.C. the northern states put a statue of him of a confederate war general He's the only person who has a statue of himself outside of a building in Washington, D.C. It's the only one you'll find. 
Well, you have to understand that Washington, D.C. itself was constructed by Freemasons, so that might tell you something. But why would a Confederate Southern States War General be highly esteemed by the Northern States? Not to say that he necessarily is, but the Freemasons did honor him. So you have to stop and consider why that's the case, and we'll get to more information on that later. But Albert Pike, I also want to mention, he was a leader among the KKK. Albert Pike was the chief judiciary of the Ku Klux Klan, which is a well-known hater of blacks. They're a racist organization. Part of his attraction to Freemasonry was because, at the time, blacks were not allowed to be members. Eventually, they came up with a... I mean, today, they allow that, but back, back then, it was not allowed, and then later, they started up a a fraternity, a section, a branch of Freemasonry that blacks were allowed to join, or they were allowed to have their own temples, but they could not mix with the whites in any way, right? Because that's how Freemasonry operated. And that was part of Albert Pike's attraction to Freemasonry was because of that fact. During a conflict among the Freemasons back in his day about whether or not they should be changing the rules about letting blacks join the Freemasons, here's what Pike wrote. And this comes from the proceedings of the M.S. Grand Lodge of Washington, Free and Accepted Masons. Here's what Pike said, quote, I am not inclined to meddle in the matter. I took my obligations to white men, not to Negroes. When I have to accept Negroes as brothers or leave Masonry, I shall leave it, end quote. So that should tell you pretty much where he was coming from concerning... All I can say is he's not a Christian, okay? How about that? So, Pike stated that Masonry itself is a religion. Okay? And, and, which means those who treat it like it's just some do-gooders club are ignorant of its true purpose. Pike also stated that Masons lie to people intentionally to keep them from understanding the truth behind Freemasonry. This is, Albert Pike wrote a very famous, or at least among Freemasons it's very famous, the book called Morals and Dogma. In volume 1, on page 104 to 105, he said, quote, Masonry, like all the religions, stop right there. Masonry, like all the religions, okay? Masonry, he's saying, is a religion of itself. Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, Hermeticism and alchemy conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages or the elect, and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth, which it calls light, from them, and to draw them away from it. Truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it or would pervert it, end quote. So what they're doing is they're calling their so-called truth light, which means they are leading you away from the light that is Jesus Christ, and they are leading you to their hidden secret mysteries. And that he said that not only is Freemasonry a religion, but they use false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead people. You see, false explanations and misinterpretations, that sounds so much like atheism, because the atheist will come along and they'll say, well, that's an untruth. Why is it that people like atheists have such a hard time with the word lie, and that people are liars? I can tell you why they have a hard time with it, because... They, the law of God is written on their hearts, and they know they are guilty of lying and being liars. That's why they have a hard time saying it. They don't want to call it a lie. The same thing as a thief wants to call it borrowing without returning. Or maybe a murderer wants to call it self-defense. They always want to call it some politically correct or long, with lots of syllables, word that seems big and fancy and and it doesn't seem as dirty as a simple one-syllable word like a lie. 
False explanations and misinterpretations. What he means, he says, we lie to people to mislead them because we don't want them to know the truth. Only those we deem who are worthy should possibly know what we really believe. So it doesn't matter what you, as a low-level Freemason, if you're in like the Blue Lodge stuff, it doesn't matter what you think you know about Freemasonry. They are lying to you because you have not proven yourself worthy of understanding the full truth of what they're really about. They draw people away from the truth and light of the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 8.20 says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If they don't speak according to the word of God, that is not light. They can call it light all they want. But those who are of Christ, we are the ones. It is our job to reprove the works of darkness, to not have any fellowship with them, as we read from Ephesians chapter 5. Freemasonry is subject to the private interpretation of the inner circles within their order. But the Bible says that the word of God, which is the true light, is not subject to any man's private interpretation. As 2 Peter 1.20 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So, after reading that quotation from Albert Pike... We need to be cautious moving forward in talking about Freemasonry because, he, like he said, they lie. They use false explanations and misinterpretations to conceal the truth behind the religion of the Masons. So much of the reason that we can know these truths is because of thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ who have saved some who were already in the high levels of Freemasonry and once they were born again, they came out of it and revealed the truth of what happens in those secret temple rituals. So, in the Bible, Tubal Cain, just to lay a foundation here, okay, Tubal Cain was the great, great, great grandson of Cain. And Cain was the one who murdered his brother Abel. But according to Masonic teachings, they claim that Tubal Cain was the first Freemason. In Genesis 4.22, it says, And Zillah, she also bare Tubalcane, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And so, with that verse, what they say, See, an artificer is a teacher. He was teaching things in brass and iron. He was the first mason. That's what they claim. Okay? And because they say, Well, see, that's in the book of Genesis. They're using biblical characters or biblical names of characters for their history, or their supposed or claimed history, that's what fools a lot of people thinking, oh, wow, so this is really Christian after all, because they talk about the Bible. Well, Catholics talk about the Bible, but that doesn't mean they're Christians. Okay? So, This is the beginning of the deception, because the Bible does accurately record that Tubal Cain was a, was a teacher of metalworking, but that doesn't mean he was a Freemason, okay? And the Masons have used this to claim that their secret order dates back to near the beginning of the creation of the earth, right? And by the way, this is why, one of the reasons why atheists are not allowed to join the Freemasons. Atheists are not allowed to join. You have to believe in a creator, in a god of some sort. Now, they don't care what religion you're a part of, so long as you believe in some sort of god. And atheists are not allowed to join the Freemasons. Albert Mackey, that's the other guy, okay, that we, we mentioned, with Albert Pike and Albert Mackey. Now, Albert Mackey, he was Grand Secretary and Worshipful Master with Solomon's Lodge Number 1, and one of the highest esteemed Masons of all time. Now he wrote in his book called An Encyclopedia of Freemasonry and Its Kindred Sciences the following, quote, The first Masonic reference to Tubalcain is found in the legend of the craft where he is called the founder of Smithcraft, end quote. So a lot of these ignorant churchgoers are getting led in because the new members are saying, wow, look, they're talking about biblical history. If they're talking about the Bible, they must be of God. But here he's saying it's it's their religious beliefs in Freemasonry that are teaching that. And I don't know why they teach it. I mean, 
it's not like they have a history for it, okay? I want people to understand they don't have any evidence for this stuff. I'm not saying this as if it's true. I'm saying they have taken this person, they have ascribed to him to be the, the first true member of their order, like the founder of it. There is no evidence for Masonic history past the Middle Ages. There is documentation of Masonic history in the Middle Ages. But outside of that, before then, there is no documented history of what they're talking about. So either the history was made up by them, or I would say more likely it was probably demonically channeled in some way. Okay, just like you have the, the authors of popular music and books who have demonically channeled certain things. For example, Led Zeppelin, the lead singer of Led Zeppelin, demonically channeled the famous song Stairway to Heaven. They talked about it. They bought Aleister Crowley's house where he did all sorts of sacrifice and ritual in this house. Okay, They purchased his house on purpose and then went in and did drugs and tried to demonically channel demons and a demon came in to one of the lead singers or one of the guys on in their band and he started writing down all the words to Stairway to Heaven. That song was written by demons, by devils. If you want to learn more about that, I would recommend the an article we have on our website called What's Wrong with Christian Rock. You can find it by typing the word music, M-U-S-I-C, into the search bar at creationliberty.com. Read through that and get the full understanding of where this stuff actually comes from. Another example, author Stephanie Meyer. She wrote that famous, or I would rather say infamous, series Twilight about the vampire junk, okay? And she confessed in, I mean, it was on her own blog, on her website. She had like a little blog journal she kept. And she told everyone that she was demonically possessed in writing that, that book. Some devil would visit her. It was a devil that she was even afraid of at certain times because she at one time tried to change the story from the way the devil in these visions she had was giving it to her. That devil revisited her and was furious with her, and she was so fearful of him because she changed part of the story that he had her do. And so I think she, like, edited it back in or something like that, but she used demonic channeling to get that. And, and it's quite possible that some of this, I mean, because even, even the do what thou wilt thing I talked about from Aleister Crowley, that's also in the thing on uh, the, the teaching I did on, on what's wrong with Christian rock. I talk about that with Aleister Crowley's history in there. I mean, when he came up with that phrase, do what thou wilt, that's the, the theme of Satanism. You realize that, I forgot to mention, even Led Zeppelin, when they did, when they, they published that record for Stairway to Heaven, on the record itself, the original record they had, they etched into it the words, do what thou wilt. These guys were Satanists. And so you need to understand the full impact of, of what that is. And we'd be surprised how many things in this world were created by devils. They were designed by them. So it's I'm saying I'm not saying that that's the way it happened, but it is very likely based on the witchcraft and and the Luciferianism that this all entails that that's how they came about this information in the first place. It was a, a demon or devil that gave that information to them. And so the next figure in the alleged history of the Masonic history, and I say alleged Masonic history because we don't know that any of it's true is is Nimrod okay now Nimrod we also covered that in another article we have by the way I'll mention it to you if you want to know more about Stephanie Meyer and her Twilight stuff if, if that you're like wow she really demonically channeled that I would recommend go to creationliberty.com type in the word fantasy f-a-n-t-a-s-y into the search bar there and that'll give you an article called fantasy novels invitations to hell there's a content section at the top, and the section is called Stephanie Meyer and Twilight. If you click on that, you can read about that. I've explained that in, in full detail there and quoted her on that stuff. And you, there, All the references are in there where you can get those quotations if you need to use those for some reason. Like if you need to see it, send it to somebody who's a Christian, who's a friend of yours, who knows who reads that stuff, you need to get to them the full knowledge and understanding of what that is. And also... If you want to learn a little bit more about Nimrod, I talk about him a little bit in the article 
We have on Christmas, the rejection of Jesus. If you just type in the word Christmas, C-R-I-S-T-M-A-S, or C-H-R-I-S-T-M-A-S. I can't even spell my own name. Anyway, the uh, Christmas, the rejection of Jesus, okay, is what that's called. And I talk about Nimrod in there to a degree because that, the worship, I mean, Nimrod was worshipped as a Babylonian god. I mean, he was like, he was worshipped as a sun god. And so Nimrod and Babylon come up in a lot of witchcraft and pagan stuff. And so that's why, you know, if you need to understand why that is, you can go to that article and you get more information of why that is the case. So in, in Genesis chapter 10, starting in verse 8, it says, And Cush became, excuse me, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. So Nimrod here is another character that's mentioned in scripture. And here's where the ignorant Christian comes in or a person, I wouldn't say Christian, the ignorant churchgoer comes in and says, oh, wow, they're talking about the Bible. It must be legitimate. It must be a real Christian religion. Though Tubal-Cain is mentioned to be the first mason, Nimrod is claimed to be the first head of their order. Now, again, from Albert Mackey, in his book called The Lexicon of Freemasonry, he said, quote, the universal sentiment of the Masons of the present day is to confer upon Solomon, king of Israel, the honor of of being their first grand master and that by the way that is often what these different masons will teach if you talk to them they'll say no no solomon was the first of our order N no that's not what is actually taught see albert Mackey is correcting that he said but the legend of the craft had long before though there was a tradition of the temple extent bestowed at least by implication that title upon nimrod the king of babylon and assyria it had attributed the first organization of a fraternity of craftsmen to him in saying that he had he gave a charge to the workmen whom he sent to assist the king of Nineveh in building his cities. That is to say, he framed for them a constitution, and in the words of the legend, that this was the first time that ever Masons had any charge of his science. And he's quoting from that old document that talks about that. It was the first time that the craft were organized into a fraternity working under a constitution or body of laws, and as Nimrod was the ocratic maker of these laws, it resulted as a necessary consequence that their first legislator, legislating with dictatorial and unrestricted sovereign power, was also their first grand master." End quote. So you see a lot of people, especially in America, would not want to say, well, no, it can't be Nimrod, because there is a lot of bad stuff in our society associated with Babylon. So they don't want to say it's Nimrod. They want to say, oh, well, Solomon uh, sounds better, so we'll use him. Well, in the Bible, Solomon wasn't any better, I can tell you that. But the point being is that this is where their first head was. It, it came, I mean, it's, it's a Babylonian mystery religion when it really comes down to it. And even though I don't care how Masons may feel, Nimrod is, speaking to, is considered to be their first leader of their order. And I just quoted, a, it, you know, Masons want to disagree with me. I just quoted from an author that you ought to respect because he's a head authority over any disputes that are involved in Masonry. But, I mean, there was a, the reason that Solomon appeared, I mean, there was just this, this paradigm shift in the mid-1800s where they just, Freemasonry began teaching that King Solomon was the first. But again, what did Albert Pike say? That they use false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled to conceal the truth. Isn't that what he just said? Yeah. Well, you see, that's the problem, is that when people believe, oh, well, this is the head of the order, yeah, that's because you don't understand the fullness of their religion. And that even if you get into higher levels, right, they might teach you that there, and then you come to an understanding of it, but then you are then directed to mislead the lower levels as well for various purposes, okay? So I think that's a good place to stop. We're going to pick up on that next week. We're going to talk about more of the foundations of Freemasonry, and then we're going to go in and talk about uh, more of their God. What is this God they actually worship, and who do they actually ascribe him to be? We'll talk about that more next week. Anybody have any questions or comments about anything we talked about today before we close?
Well, thanks for joining us, everybody, this week. And may the Lord Jesus Christ bless and protect you all as you seek to study his word and glorify him in all that you say and do. And God willing, we will see you next week.